That has happened. What? Ready? Okay. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Um, let's just do something to start off with before we pray. Let's read 1 through 4. 1 through 4. And prayerfully, I'll get through 6 tonight. Not going to happen. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be no benefit to you. I, and I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he's under obligation to keep the whole law. You have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again as we uh, approach the sh your word tonight that we do justice to it, be with the speaker, uh, help him to be clear, again, as we deal with different nuances within these passages. Father, I just, uh, we love you and we want to hear from you in Jesus' name, amen. Um, so, here's where we got to back up just for one second because there's no slide for it. Uh, we we got to remember Paul is distinctly talking to the Galatian church. I don't know if you realize that when Paul is addressing the church, he's talking to believers, both Jewish and Gentile believers. A church does not uh, form in the New Testament with unbelievers as part of its core. It's not a church if unbelievers are there. So, if you, see, you know, there may be people like today that visit churches that are unbelievers, but they're not the church. The def definition of church is when uh, believers gather together uh, for the purpose of equipping the saints. That's kind of a short definition of what a church is. Uh, so when we go through different sections, especially in Galatians, we got to ask ourselves, is he talking to the people that are believers that are in the body of Galatia, or is he talking to people that are coming in to that group of people that carry a different uh, theological distinction, or is he talking to people that had held to an understanding biblically about certain things and now are no longer following that course because you're going to see all three of those groups of people Paul will address, especially in 5 and 6. Because chapters 5 and 6 is when we take what we've learned from the first four chapters and now it's, we're looking at application. Kind of following with me? Because it gets really sticky because he goes, you and them and how did you do this and we do this and... And we've really got to kind of say, okay, let's regroup every time because, uh, as you see, when he, when he says the word in verse, uh, we're not going to cover verse 1, he says, do, you not, do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. So that would probably be more than likely Jewish people at one point that followed the law, and now they're saying, hey, we've got to follow the law as a believer. And that has come into the church. So there's believers in here thinking they have to follow the law to be right with God on a consistent basis, and there's unbelievers that think they're being told that you have to be circumcised to be saved, and we see that when Acts chapter 15 unfolds, and we did that when we started the book of Galatians. So it's kind of, and that's why it says study to show yourselves approved. It doesn't say just read it a few times and you're good. It says study the scriptures. And that's what our intent here at Southwood is to do, is to study the Scriptures, ask the questions, say, is this who always been taught this way? Is it right? Is it wrong? What's the best understanding of this verse in context and what's happening here? Um, I find it kind of interesting what he says in verse 2, because we're really picking up in verse 3. He says, Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ is no benefit to you. So he's keying off of this verse because I believe this verse starts chapter 5, where verse 1 kind of ended chapter 4. So what I wanted to say, let's start with this slide and kind of work our way around verses 3 and 4 and get to 5 and 6 through this slide. You want to do law, Christ is no benefit to you. You want to be law-oriented, you as a believer, unbeliever, either way you want to go, if you want to orient yourself to the law, do to get, do to be, do to, you know, for blessing, for whatever, and he'll say here um, in verse 4 about justification, and we got to decide, and then he talks about righteousness in, chapter, in verse 5, so there's a lot of theological words, but if you want to follow law, do law, Christ is no benefit, and just think about that for a minute. What does grace say? 
The understanding of grace means Christ is all of grace. It's, it's not about works. It's not about what you do. So we really see right away the tension that Paul is drawing between what was normally had been taught and what had escalated to a system it wasn't meant to be. Law was never meant to save anybody. Law, and it's not, and it still doesn't, but they had brought it to the point that it was so important to be law-abiding. Now, understand something. You also don't want to walk around and tell everybody, do whatever you want. Christ is good with that. But following something to get something from God, such as your, your place in Christ, your life as a believer, your righteousness, your justification. Law wasn't meant to do that. Law was meant for a nation that had come out of Egypt, already redeemed, in order to set a guideline and a standard that was different from the rest of the world. And if you read through the law, that's different than the world is today even. But they didn't do it to be right with God. They did it because they were right with God. Is that clear? So they already had a standing with God. Now it's come to the point by this time in Galatians where people said, well, if we got to do this, so we can have that standing with God. And that's a misrepresentation of law. Law is perfect, law is holy, law is just, you know, those kind of things, and it's meant for the specific purpose. So if you want to do law, that's what I put up here, what benefit does Christ have for you? And on the other side, we have Christ, what else is needed? And that's where I think we're going in the book of Galatians in chapter 5, where we're going with what he said, because he's going to have these two tensions going at each other. The law system versus the grace system. And, they, and I think I said this, I don't know how long ago, when we started the book of Galatians, you can't mix these two. These two can't be mixed. You can't say, well, I can have, you know, 50%, you know, grace, 50% law, or whatever mix you want to put in. Or sometimes I have to be in the law like once every, what, seventh day, I've got to obey that law. And that's just not true. Now, now, kind of walk with me and, and, and understand what's going on. Paul is saying this in verse 2, and I think we really need to grab a hold of what's going on. He's writing this whole letter, and all of a sudden in chapter 5, he says, Behold, I, Paul, say to you. Now, to me, that comes across like, okay, I didn't know it was Paul writing. Is that kind of weird to you? Of course you know it's Paul writing. Why is he putting that in there? Because, again, he's, he's going back to his authority to say certain things, his apostleship. He's saying, it's, it's, it's me, it's Paul. I'm going to say something to you as the authority figure in this church, the, the apostle that's kind of set you all up. I'm the one that's going to say this, and you need to hear this. Um, again, just think about it in a general sense. Is anything wrong with circumcision? And the answer's got to be what? No. Some people may say it's important for, for identification purposes. Some people may say, well, there's cleanliness involved, which whatever with that. It's innocuous, some, but in you lift it up out of what its packaging was meant for because it's really meant for Israel as a sign of the covenant. And that's why, hey, did, you know some of the strangest passages in Scripture kind of go, fit in better when you understand how important things are? Remember the incident with Zipporah and Moses and the foreskins and how mad she was? Because Israel's being led out by Moses, and the sign of Israel being a, a nation and different was circumcision. This is Moses, the deliverer. Was his son circumcised? No. How can he lead a nation out and not have the sign on his own children? So that's why she was kind of took, took the role and did something that was kind of weird, but it's because she, he should have led by example. He should have done that. Now, you're gonna, now, I know some of you think like I do, so I'm sorry for that. How would anybody have known, <laughs> you know? Because it mattered to the person that knew Zipporah, and that's how we know. Otherwise, what? There would have been a cover-up in that whole thing. Sorry. Some of you will get it later. But as we look at this, Paul is saying in verse, in, in verse 2, if you receive circumcision for the purpose of being obedient to the law and to get something from God and to have that standing, Christ, therefore, has no, absolutely no benefit, no product, uh, production that he will give, give you 
<clears throat> excuse me, and notice at the end it says to you. That's to your advantage. What is to anybody's advantage? You want a leg up in anything? Stay with Christ. You want to take something else? You're not going to be, you're not going to have an advantage. You're going to be at a disadvantage. And that's what Paul's going to go into in verse three. So kind of let's 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 look at this idea in verse three and four of the consequences of replacing. And I put the grace, and it sounds awkward, because that's the way the, the Bible has it in the original Greek. When, it's, when we get to verse 4, it says, fallen from the grace. It's very specific. Um, so we know what grace is, right? The idea of the grace program we're in. God has always had grace. There's not a time God hasn't graced people out. But when Christ came, did what he needed to do on the cross, we are now sufficiently understanding the fullness of the grace program. Okay, or the grace system, whatever you want to call it, or the idea of grace. So when we see the grace, I want you to understand that. So verse 3 says, And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he's under obligation to keep the whole law. <clears throat> now I'm going to say something that's kind of interesting when you go through this, and we will walk through it best we can. But he's talking about law, and at the same time, Paul's being very legal. So he's writing things that are very legally oriented but it, because the law is involved. So when he begins his sentence uh, here, he says, I testify again. The idea of testify is the idea of being in a courtroom. He's, he's going to give his, his oath, I guess, is the best way to say it. So um, again, oh, I don't want to do that yet. Don't look at that. Oh, I went too far, back too far. Anyway, um, no, I could do that. Okay, good. we'll give you the hint. Okay, I'm going to give you up front the translation I looked at of verse 3 because I really want you to see something. Uh, and I, Paul, testify again to every man being circumcised, he is a debtor to the whole law. And that's what we're going to, you know, if we, if we would go through different statements in chapter 5 and 6, there's a lot of controversy over what's being said, especially fallen from grace. What does that mean? And that's pretty simple. You'll see that as we go through it tonight. More than likely. Uh, but think about this for a minute. If you were to say, um, I have a cheesecake. This is going to be a bad analogy. I have a cheesecake, okay? And I just want a piece of that cheesecake because I will be a cheesecake-aholic with that one piece. What you're going to get is a taste of the cheesecake, and that's it. But you really haven't taken the whole pie. You haven't made it your own. And when you take circumcision, First of all, let me kind of put it this way. Circumcision is really not the, if you go 613 laws, in the, and we'll deal with this in a moment, 613 uh, laws within the system of Israel, and you take circumcision, it's really not the mainframe of that law system. It's a sign that Abraham was given 430 years before there was a law. It was incorporated into the law in the wilderness because Israel had to identify as a nation. So it was more of a, hey, we want to not only have a covenant, the Mosaic covenant, but we also want our people of the Abrahamic covenant. So there's a duality there. So it became a law, but it really wasn't part of the law. And what, what Paul is going to deal with here more than anything is we can't, and I look at it like this. How many laws are there? 613? I'm not sure that's a correct count, but we're going to use that for tonight, okay? But that's what most people say. So let's say tomorrow night you're going out to dinner and the buffet line has 613 items, okay? You cannot, you can pick and choose from that buffet line. You can get ribs, you can get shrimp, whatever you want. I'm going to make everybody hungry before we're done. Cheesecake, ribs, shrimp, we got everything else. <laughs> got to throw in some veggies for those that don't care for those other things. Um, but when, we, when I go to a buffet line, I, I gotta, there's certain things I'm just going to get, you know? And that's really not what the law is like. The law is not a buffet. Some will pick what? There's laws today that people will say, we're Seventh-day people. We're going to pick that law. We're Seventh-day people. What about the rest of them? I mean, you cannot uh, say, I'll be circumcised. Now, again, that's an exterior law. There, it's very vague in the Old Testament. But how, I'm circumcised, so I keep the whole law. Well, it wasn't even my option to get circumcised. They didn't ask me. 
How about the Passover? We're doing a Passover Seder, and it's a high holy holiday. And what's interesting is, is a lot of Jewish people I knew when I grew up, they'd go to temple three times a year, like Christians, but the Christians overlap a little bit. Christians are what? Easter Christians and Christmas Christians, right? You ever heard of those? Okay. So Jews are the same way. You got Passover, Day of Atonement. You got different Jews that go to the temple. That's picking and choosing. The law was never meant to pick and choose what you wanted to obey. You had to do it all. And, and it's, a, it, it's um, and what this comes down to, because everybody calls it like their Judaizers are coming in or there's legalism. I just, I just put it down to a thinking process. It's what one thinks he can do to obtain what Christ has done. It's what a person thinks he can do to obtain what Christ has already done. That's what we're looking at. If Christ has done it all, what do you need to do? And if you say, well, I don't know, there may be in today's atmosphere, you may have to be baptized because I'm sure somewhere in the Bible there's those, are those wet Christians that, that are much, must avail themselves. Um, but think what people do to say, if you don't do this, you're not going to uh, get what God has for you. You're not going to get that second blessing. You're not going to get, if you don't obey God, you're therefore a failure as a Christian. And God, you may want to check your salvation at the door because you're not obedient. And um, so what I, what I kind of look at is there is a replacement theology out there that's horrible, b bigger than what we look at as Israel, as the church has replaced Israel, which is a grievous doctrine. But there's also a doctrine out there is what can we do to replace Christ or lessen Christ? Um, and think for a moment. You're all good thinkers. What has Christ done for you you could not do for yourself? Isn't it? Can't we come out with a lot of things on that idea? It's just not the cross he's done for you because you're a small person. In, this, in the scheme of the world, you're, not, you're just a dot on the screen. You're going to be here for a certain amount of time, and that's it. What's the impact you're going to make on the world? Just a, a smidgen. Christ has made an impact because he did it all for you. And think for a minute, just, just for a moment. Everybody in the Old Testament is looking for Christ. They were looking to the promises of a Messiah coming various stages of the one that would come and fulfill it all. Why? Because they couldn't do it. It was a struggle. I don't know about you. I love watching sports. And in sports, everybody's got a little cheat sheet. A, a new batter comes up and the pitcher pulls off his hat and he pulls out a little thing or the outfielder, you see him pull out a thing because they're greeting a card on that batter, what, he's, what his tendencies are. Okay? On the football field, you see a quarterback, give you the, he has the play sheet. Okay? Everybody's got, why? Because nobody's got a mind that can remember all these things. How, what was the play sheet for keeping the law? Think about it for a minute. Know what they had? They had prophets. And the prophets constantly reminded them what the law was and how they were breaking it, and they have to return to God. I think one of the number one words other than names in the Bible is the word shub in the Old Testament, which means return. Return. You're a nation that was godly nation. Return back to me. Return. And how often did Israel what? Move away, come back, move away. I mean, it was a cycle, right? Many cycles. And they're in a cycle now. And, th and as we look at this again, um, let's view things through the eyes of people in their deathbeds. How many people in their deathbeds they think at that moment, okay, I can wait to that moment, and I will confess my sins and, and have the peace I need to depart with. What's the probability of that actually happening? First of all, it's slim. I'm not going to say it's none because somebody will say, oh, my grandfather did that. Um, but if that's what you're thinking will get you right with God, that last moment, that's not it. Christ has no benefit to you. And in the Christian life, as we lead the Christian life, Christ is beneficial, not just for salvation, that initial salvation. It's all of it. He's provided everything for us for life and godliness, and we will see that as we go through it. Um, so let's just talk about that unbreakable unit. Go to James, hold your finger in Galatians. Go to James chapter 2. 
James, ugh, James chapter 2. And then we'll talk just a little bit more about the law. James chapter 2. I had a teacher in high school. He taught, it was my history teacher. He was also a camp counselor I had for summer camps. His name was James 210. I don't, uh, I don't even know where he is today. But James 2.10 says this, For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one, one, how many did we say there were for conversation's sake? 613. I did 612, but I broke one. Guess what it says? He has become guilty of all. Now, I don't know about you all. That's too much stress on me. Way too much. 613 laws. Let me tell you a little something about them. There's positive laws and negative laws. Most of you know the thou shall nots. Those are the negative kind of things, but there's others you should do. And talking about a yoke, what does it say in verse 1 of Galatians chapter 5? The yoke of slavery, the yoke of bondage that my computer still will not let be printed on anything. Think of that, yoke of bondage, 613 laws. And if you break one, you can't say, well, I was 612 to the good. You broke one. Here's what the law is covered, and this isn't full of uh, the, all, all of them, but I'm going to give you some idea. It covered clothing. How many of you checked what you wore today? I mean, think of the stress on that. Couldn't mis mix certain uh, fabrics with other fabrics. And that's, I don't even know what polyester, cotton, satin, latex, I don't know what I got. The doctor the other day said, are you allergic to latex? I go, I have no idea. Is this a new thing? I go, you're taking blood. I don't know if it's a real matter to me. Clothing. There was laws for clothing. Not how high the skirt length was or how tight. What fabrics you wore together. Marriage. Lev the Levitical priesthood had laws of washing and cleansing. As the priest was going about his work. Sacrifices. Everybody talks about Christ as a sacrifice, but he replaced all the sacrifices. The daily sacrifice, a weekly, monthly, yearly, once a year. We can do this all day long. You want to be a priest, it's a full-time job. It's on and on and on. There were social laws, there were civil laws, there were ceremonial laws, and you had to obey them all. And I barely touched the surface. You needed someone around to tell you what was obeying the law and what wasn't. So the Mishnah came out. I don't know what spitting matters to people, but there's certain laws that had to do with spitting. I don't know if this was an issue until I saw these laws. So they elaborated on the 613 to make sure you were doing it. You know, when I was a kid, I, I loved science. And one of the things about science, I learned about calories. Calories, what energy it takes to burn off something. You, have a, you ate something, it's a calorie. It's how much work you extend to, to use that calorie. You, when you're Jewish, there's only so much you can walk on a day of the Sabbath. You can, walk, you can walk less than a mile. That's all. Now, I don't know. Can you imagine Moses out there with a pedometer going, oh, I'm stuck. I hit my limit. You see how, see how much tension there is on this, what we call a yoke of bondage? And go to Romans chapter 2. Let's look at something even further. I know there's a comedy effect to this, but there's a lot of stress to this because this is what was going on. And, the, and these people that had come in said, you must be circumcised to have a relationship with God. And people took that to, you know, because they want to do the, what the right thing is. Problem is, people do the right thing. They don't do the godly thing. And that's what messes up a lot of things today because we still have a an abundance of false teachers with us today because they, they sound like they want us to do the right thing, but is it the godly thing? Romans chapter 2, verse 25 says, for indeed, circumcision is of value. Is Paul contradicting himself? Notice what he says. If you practice the law, but if 
If you are a transgressor of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. In other words, you did this. You got circumcised. But now you fail in a different area. Your circumcision doesn't matter. You broke the whole law. You see what's going on? How's your stress level going? Getting stressed a little bit? Verse 26. If therefore the circumcised man keeps the requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? And will not he who is physically uncircumcised, if he keeps the whole uh, the law, will not uh, will he not judge you who have, uh, though uh, living the letter of the law and circumcision are a transgressor of the law? In other words, you you can't keep this going on. These two things don't go together. You can't do these things. Notice what it says in verse 28, though. I think this is important. He is not a Jew who is one outwardly. Interesting. Neither is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. What God's looking at is the heart. God's looking at the heart, because it says in verse 29, but he is a Jew uh, who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter, and his praise is not for men, but from God. See, they were looking at everything at a physical standard. These are the things we do physically to be right with God, but you got to do things spiritually to be right with God. What did, what did we talk about on Sunday? Nicodemus was told you must be what? Born again, he took it physical, God, and Jesus is saying, no, born from above. It's spiritual. And you cannot mix that physical with spiritual and get what you want from God out of it, it or just take the physical. What's, what's that old state, statement most people say? I'm okay. God will accept me. I'm okay. What is your standard? Because my standard says in the Bible, no one's okay. Not one. No, not one. And, and when we look at this word here in, in, this, in Romans chapter 2, the word for keep is a Greek word for do. And what it's saying is, then you are to do the whole law. That's what we have here. Same idea here. He's a debtor to do the whole law. To the whole law. Now, we're going to stick with that word in a few minutes, this idea, uh, and work on it a little bit. So what we're looking at, if you're supposed to do the whole law, and that makes you, that places you in a position of being a debtor, what do you do? I broke the law. I owe the law. I got to break the, fix the law. I'm constantly in this debtor situation. How do you get out of debt? Anybody know how to get out of debt? It's kind of a simple process. Stop spending and what? Make enough to pay it off. Now, try and bring that to the physical side of this relationship. You broke the law. Now you have to do what? Stop breaking the law and pay it back. To who? To God. What does God require for breaking the law? What's the penalty for sin? It's a no-win situation, isn't it? Isn't that a no-win situation? So what we're looking at here, believe it or not, is a legally binding contract. You do one law to be right with God, you have to do them all, and that's called a contract. You want to, and you have to keep that idea of a contract and all the terms that go with the contract. I don't know if you can do that. It was never meant to do that. Now, not only is a person one who owes a debt, which is kind of easy to understand from the word, right? The other point of being a debtor is you're under an obligation. You're under an obligation. And the obligation here is to constantly do the whole law to repay the debt. To con we could say it like this, to contractually fulfill all the written specifications. So when you go to the, the Old Testament law for life, if you were to take it, that would you, you would gain your spiritual life out of it. You'd have to fulfill all its writ, written stipulations, all its written specifications. Do you see the yoke of bondage? That's what I want you to get at tonight mostly. Is this is what was happening. They were going back to a yoke of bondage no one could bear. 
And then Jesus in the, in the Gospels will tell the Pharisees, you're putting even more on the people than the yoke of bondage. How much can they bear? And nowhere in the Old Testament scriptures does it say you have to do these laws or continue to these, do these laws to gain justification. You know what the Old Testament says about justification? It's by faith, which is a spiritual thing, not a physical thing. You understand what I'm saying? Faith is always in the object. In the Old Testament, the faith was always placed into God's promises. Who is going to fulfill the promises? Are you going to help God? If you read through all the prophecies in the Bible, how much did you help God? Now, first of all, just for conversation, none of you were there. <laughs> so you didn't help at all. And if there, there are more promises today, and we can't help. It's on God's calendar. So under the law, under the law, here's what else happened. The more you put somebody under the law, the more they end up breaking the law. It's really fascinating. You could see it in a child. Tell a child not to do something and give them enough time. And what will they do? They will do it. Little do, they'll do it. I almost want to take little Johnny. You want to put something in the light socket? Do it now. Let's get it over with because you won't do it again. I don't want to keep telling you stop trying to put something in there. Because why? Because that's the nature we have is we're going to do things we're told not to do. So law was, was giving nation of Israel a paradigm which in the, with, with, to live with as a nation. And guess what they were doing? They were always going outside, outside. God said to them, here, this is simple, okay? Don't mix with the nations around you. Don't. How many times did God say that? Lots of times, okay? Not once, lots of times, because guess why? They kept doing it. And by the time we reach the end of the Old Testament period, they're still doing it. They would be idolaters, God told them. And you would, be, you would not be in a position of being blessed. You'd be cursed. And guess what they were doing? They were still doing it. So what makes you think, Galatians, whoever he's talking to in this, and I believe at this particular time, he's generalizing the idea in Galatians chapter 5. And, and he's saying, you think you can do it when no one else has done it? You can, take, you can be fully obedient and not break one law? Start with one and get to the 613. See how you do. Now today, that's what drives me nuts. People want to use the Old Testament law to live by, and they don't have two, 613 you can even do. The tabernacle was in town. Most of the, their life circled around that tabernacle. Most of the laws a good majority of them, circled around what was going on in that place. And they have, oh, that was only for Israel. Those are ceremonial laws. They don't count. Since when did the Bible separate ceremonial laws out from civil and social? There's no separation, but people do it today. And here's what the law did. The law showed where you failed. The law showed where you failed. The law showed you were a debtor, and the law gave you consequences for your actions. And it's interesting because God always warns. If you do that, this will happen. No, it won't. Yeah, it will. We'll just try it. Go ahead, try it. And that happened. And you say, well, how did God know that? The law, keeping the law to be right with God was not a system of success. It was never meant to be a system of a success. It was to keep the nation as a unit so that people would see something was different and they would then take the message to the world. How did they do? How did they do? And that saddens me. So what Paul here is doing is, is basically testifying, and he says, and I, verse 3, just look at it. He says, and I testify again. That means Paul's been saying this many times to them in many ways, and we just get a concise understanding of it. Uh, and again, it's a, it's, it's a word that's used in court. So Paul is basically standing before um, the Galatian church, and he says, this is the courtroom, and I'm going to testify to you something about this. If you want to be law-oriented, go ahead. 
What's the Jewish, famous Jewish name? Mazel tov. Go for it. Good luck. Which is not a biblical term, by the way. Um, but you got to keep them all. That's how it works. You got to keep them all. And you'll, and you'll forever. That's why it's up here in this typo like this. Um, you'll forever be a debtor. You'll never, never, ever be outside that debt. So then we get to verse 4, and verse 4 has two. We're going to look at two parts of verse 4. Um, well, let's, let's just read it first. So let's read verse 4. You have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. Now, I th again, Paul doesn't mix words, and we'll have to look at this idea of being severed from Christ. So, we, so there's two parts. You have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by the law. Now, if you just take the English understanding, we're going to go into the Greek a little bit. Severed from Christ, and he's talking about circumcision. Do you get the humor? Just, okay, one, two, three, you get it. And the second part we're going to look at is, is, is a very misunderstood statement, you have fallen from the grace. Now, let's just, let's just kind of walk through this uh, as best we can. So part one is you've been severed from Christ. You are seeking to be justified by law. Now, first of all, there's a bunch of things going on here. First, you cannot be justified by the law, but they're seeking that. There's not a verse in the entire Bible that says you can keep the law and be justified. I've already said that once. I'm saying it again so you know that my testimony is true. <laughs> you can go look it up. Uh, I've tried to find it. All you have to do is real easy. You type into a search engine justified in the Old Testament, and you're only going to see it attached to the idea of faith. Nothing else. Um, so what we have here, though, let's talk about this word, uh, which is a verb in the passive, uh, er, what is, oh, er's passive uh, indicative. Uh, so this is basically, basically talking about, oh, here's the interesting thing. What's the first word in, your, in, in verse 4? It says, you have been severed, right? It is the first word, severed, is the first word, in, which is unusual. Greek doesn't usually start with a verb first. So it's already out of word order for you to focus on this word as being somewhat emphatic, okay? So you can make it a little bolden. Severed from Christ. Severed from Christ. The word here basically means make idle or useless, waste, abolish, cease, do away with, destroy, put out of action. The thing I want you to see more than anything is when, you, when I pull up a dictionary, this is from a lexicon, and here's the definition, you can automatically see this is not a technical word because there's multiple possibilities for the use of the word. You understand where I'm going? It's simple. If I only had one, one use of this word, like it, said, it would say useless, there's no other word you could put in for it. And here, since it's a compound word, it's even really uh, a little bit more tricky. Uh, I also, the idea here, cease or do away with, uh, destroy, they're really not all that similar, some of these. Waste, abolish. Uh, so when we kind of put these two ideas together, um, let's just kind of walk through some of this so we can get an idea. The person seeking to be justified by means of the law puts himself in a place where Christ is no benefit, verse 2. Verse 3 is a debtor, and now verse, I mean, and verse 4 is saying, now he's severed, and I believe translators here were being punny. Because this is a, uh, I don't know if anybody has a different translation. It doesn't have severed, but I don't think it's the best of words. Um, cause he, but it is being kind of punny because he said in the verse before, you who want to be circumcised are now severed from Christ. Um, but it says, um, the idea here more than anything is your connection to Christ is gone. There is no established connection. If you're going to do this and you're going to live under law, you don't have a connection to Christ. And the next verse, I mean, verse 6, let's try to go to verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, as believers, we're in Christ Jesus. What these people are doing is severing themselves from that relationship, whether they're being believers that are in the church that want to get something because they got to add to. And, and it's kind of hard because today we ask questions like, 
Can a believer do this? Sure. I'm going to say this. Any believer here can do anything and be legal with it. I want to do this. I want to celebrate Passover every year with my family. Fine. Why? Tradition, explain the story. Fine. But if you want to do it to be right with God and God says, hey, you've put in nine Passovers. You're good. You get points. No, that's not how it works. You understand? We're in Christ. We have freedom to do these things. But you don't have freedom to do things that are what? Illegal. Right? But we have freedom to do certain things. But if you want to do something to be right with God, you are severed. You're you're removed from Christ. Keep that in mind. Your relationship you can't happen in that frame. You can't go to God and say, hey, listen, look at the thing, litany of things I did. I want my reward. As an unbeliever, you can't say, well, I did this. Now I should be justified. It's not happening. And I'm going to tell people tonight, those on YouTube and you, if you think you can do something to earn your salvation, you'll never have security of your salvation because you have to do it. And in the same means here, you have to continually Keep doing it. Otherwise, what? How could you possibly have the sureness that you've accomplished? And I think there's a problem with that because I don't think I ever do things productively correct. Okay? I'm good. You know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm inwardly, I control my perfectionists. I want to do everything perfect. So I love two things, caulking and paint. Because I make a mess of things. So I can caulk it. I can paint it, and you'll never know it was there. When we rebuilt our house and homestead, I could tell you every flaw there because I'm a perfectionist. Nobody saw them. But I put it in, and I caulked it, and I painted it. You understand? You can't do that with a the, with the believer's life. It's got to be all Christ. You can't say, well, I made a mistake. I'll just caulk it and paint it. It's not how it works. And notice it says you are severed from Christ. From Christ, the word there, the words there is apotu Christos. Basically, you're away from Christ. You removed yourself from Christ, which is interesting because you can never lose that relationship because Christ never moves. But you can move away from it because now you're not in a grace system. You're doing something to be right with Him. Do you understand? If you're not a believer, you'll you'll you've severed yourself from a grace situation, and it's interesting. It's the only time this term, this idea here of being severed away from Christ is ever used in the Bible. And I really think it's because Paul is upset. And he's making, now if you look at that word, it's a compound word. It's made up of kata and ergo. So it's a compound word. So you can do that. When you're you're dealing with a very dynamic language like Greek, and you can have, we're going to look at, uh, not tonight, we're going to look at a tripound word. I call it tripound because everybody says it's a three-compound word. It's three words put together and then a different ending. So it's like, what do you have there? Because Paul is heated. And unlike me who just stumbles over words when I get upset, he makes them up. So living in a legal sphere, Wanting to get graced rewards, you can't do that. That's not how it works. Paul is giving you a legal affidavit saying that's not how it works. Law keepers with Christ have no benefit. And the third idea behind this verse, in addition, Paul likes this word so many times, he uses it 25 times, the kata ergo. He uses the idea severed away from the Messiah once, but he uses the word many times in different ways. Um, look at Hebrews 2.14. It's not Paul's. This is the Bible's word. I know somebody's going to say, oh, you're saying Paul, and it's, no, it's not. But I want you, I want you to see this in Hebrews, because it's only used once in Luke and once in Hebrews, which I don't believe are Paul writing them. All the rest of the uses are Paul's. So it's a Pauline type of word. He owns this word. So whoever wrote Hebrews is using a loan word. So he so we can't walk up to me afterwards. Paul wrote it because of this word. No, because Luke used it. So Luke wrote the Hebrews. Do with what you want. That's not who I, I believe, but. Um, verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 14, Hebrews, it says, since, since then the children share in the flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, 
that through death he might render powerless him who had power of death, that is the devil. So here it's translated, rendered him powerless. It's the same word. He's powerless. So Christ became a, a human in order to die so that he put Satan in a place of no power. Inoperative, ineffective. So I would say this, you want to you want to live by the law, you want to abide by the law, you want to do the law, you make Christ ineffective. Which is just theologically wrong. You destroy. Now it's interesting because he says basically that Satan was destroyed from having the power over over death. Uh, you want to listen, this is important. You want to live and be be justified by works. You have to make what Christ accomplished on the cross for you effective. And that only comes by means of faith. It's called grace. Christ accomplished on the cross what you could not do for yourself. That is a place of accomplishment. That is a place of effectiveness. You replace Christ with a little bit of anything or a lot of something else, you've made that ineffective. Now, let's kind of do this in the last 15 minutes. Let's talk about falling from grace. Now, I have heard this spun so many different ways. You've fallen from grace, therefore you're not a believer anymore. Now, first of all, I preempted everything telling you. Paul is talking to various groups. We cannot nail this down and say it's, he's talking to believers. Therefore, they've fallen from grace. They no longer have salvation. That's not his, first of all, that's not his audience. And, it, and I've heard different people deal with Galatians chapter 5 in different areas, and they say, he's just dealing with Jewish believers. Some people say he's just dealing with Gentile believers. Some people will say he's dealing with non-believers. I mean, it's kind of all over the board. And I'd say, yeah, to all of those, sure. Because I'm not too sure. When Paul says we, and when he says you, and, and it's kind of hard to nail down. But this I do understand, fallen from grace does not equal loss of salvation. It's not in the context, it's not in the Bible. You can't find it anywhere in the Bible. Um, now, understand this. How is one justified? Let's walk, walk this through. How is one justified? That means found a place where God will look at them and say, they are vindicated from their sins. Is it by law or is it by means of grace? You only have two choices, so it's a really good multiple-choice test because I hated the ones that had four, and then the last one said, all of the above. Or the last one said, none of the above. Or said, how about both A and C? <laughs> you stop this. Just give me the, you know, because multiple choice, you could really get away with a good score. This is multiple choice. Either you are justified by law. Can you find a verse for me? If you can't, then you're going to stay with me and say, justified uh, justification of, by means of grace. Now, just let's, let's talk about that for a minute. If you're falling from the grace, are you falling from justification or are you falling from the grace? It doesn't say falling from justification. It says falling from grace. And it says the grace in the Greek, which I find fascinating. It's not generalizing it. It's saying there's a grace system. And how does God work? He works by, for you are saved by grace through faith, right? Yes, we all know those verses. If not, if, and don't say Ephesians 2.8. It's 2.5 first. Let's stick with 2.5. It's a little bit easier because it sets the basis for 2.8. So let's look at the terms. Let's walk through these. And kind of get a picture of what's going on. So what does it say when you say fallen? First of all, the fallen is ekpepto, uh, pepto. Now, it's interesting. Again, he uses a compound word. Ek means uh, to, away from as a source, and pepto means to fall. So it's interesting. If I want to say you fell from grace, I didn't even have to say ek. So why does he put ek on there? I think it's interesting that he does. Uh, so we have these translation possibilities fall off or from, drop away, lose or fail. I think this is a fun word. I like this word because the uses of it is this. Ready for this? There's four main uses of this word. And it is a compound word, so it's kind of, I would say it's a little intensified. You just didn't fall from grace. I mean, you really fell from grace. Um, and, and grace is not the source anymore. So you fell, 
And grace is no longer the source. First of all, it talks about objects which fall from their place or out of their place to another place. So if a book fell off your shelf, you could say it ekpepto because it fell off the shelf to where? The floor. So that's kind of the idea of falling. It's no longer on the shelf, though. You with me so far? Okay. Um, secondly, it's a nautical term. I like this. You're a sailor and you fall overboard, you're ekpepto. Why? Because you're no longer on the boat. It's not a good place to be in the water. You got to get back on the boat, but you've fallen away from the boat into the water. And if you stay there long enough, the boat's going to go further away. <laughs> it's inevitable. It always works that way. Um, it also is used for a shipwreck. Why? Because a ship has fallen from its right place on the water to being in the water. So you could say it's got its ekpepto to become baptismo. <laughs> <laughs> If you really want to have fun with words. Third use of the words is to be driven out or to be banished. Because you're, if I said to you, you're no longer allowed to come here, you're driven out of Southwood to the streets, and you're away from the church. Kind of get the idea? Thirdly, I mean, fourthly, it's used metaphorically to express the idea of being deprived of something. I haven't had a stake in months. Like pepto, so you may need pepto when you eat o. <laughs> but you get all these different nuances. What they all have in common is you're away from something as a source to something else as the source. Okay? I think the best picture is the sailor overboard. His sourcing was on the ship. He fell from the ship into the water, and his new source is now the water. Right? So if you take it now, let's put it back into the Bible. And Well, look, before you do this, I think the, the interesting thing is to look up the Old Testament use, and it's only used two times in the Old Testament, okay? It's used in 2 Kings 6, 5, when it talks about where the axe head was taken from the handle of the axe, and it was taken and put into the water. It's a beautiful picture. It was on the axe. It was an axe on the handle, and it, was, it went now useless place into the water. That's 2 Kings 6, 5. And Isaiah 14, 12, speaking of Lucifer, hey, this works. He fell from heaven. Heaven is not his source. Is he allowed in? Sure, when God wants him to. He's allowed to do certain things because God gives him bad use of the word, but a little bit of grace, okay? He can do certain things because God allows him, but he's fallen from that as a source. Where's, where's Satan's source now? Where is he? He's fallen from that to what? And let me give you the parsing of the word. So we're still dealing with ekpepto. It's an aorist active ind indicative. The one who is in de a debtor, one who has placed themselves away from Christ and wants to follow the law system, for himself, as an event and as a fact, he has fallen away, he's been cast away, he's been banished from the grace system. You can't do those things and say, I still want to be graced out by God. You're not in that system. You're away from it into another system. You haven't lost your salvation. You got to go follow the whole law. Paul's already said that. And you cannot have your feet or be sourced, let's do it that way. You can't be sourced in two different systems. How will that work out for you? That's, the, that's a real good definition of schizophrenia. Law today, grace today, law today. I mean, what are you going to do? You can't do that. Therefore, it's not about losing your salvation. It's, about more than, uh, it's more about not having salvation. If you think for yourself that you can do something to be justified, you fall away from grace. What does it say before this? Let's look at this. You who have been severed from Christ, you're seeking to be justified by law. You're not in a grace system. You're in a different system altogether. And you can't be. You've been, you've been you've out of the boat on that. So let's kind of wrap up a little bit this idea. So we, we kind of looked at this idea. Um, there's two ways of life. That's all Paul's talking about. Two, I talked about two options. There's two ways now. Um, 
So they're seeking to be justified. Oh, let, let's just do this real quick because we've got about five minutes. Seeking to be justified another way is not even a gospel. And what does Paul begin his book with? You're seeking a different gospel. He says that in 1 6. You, he called these, des, called these people in chapter 1, verse 6, deserters of, the, of grace. They've deserted grace. And in verse 7 of the same, he says, you're, you're, you believe a different gospel. It's not a gospel at all. Do you see where he's going with this? He's been developing this throughout all of Galatians. They're cut off from Christ, and they're, who is only, now, let me be as clear as I can. If you're cut off from Christ, and he's the only sole provision for your salvation, put those together. And you don't have freedom. You're going to be under a yoke of bondage you can't bear. So here's what I put up here. The works law way, failure. There's no success in it. I have never met anybody. Um, there's, an, there's, an, there's a story that's gone around. A guy was broken down in Utah once, okay? And he was looking at what we, let's put it this way. He was looking at Utah and its beautiful white snow, but we could do it this way. He was looking at the eclipse without glasses. Okay, and he, he was good. So he goes into this restaurant and he asks them for two things. Do you sell glasses here? Okay, and do you, can I have a cup of coffee? Now we're in Utah. <laughs> can't have coffee, it has caffeine. They said, you can't have that. We can't even give it to you because that's legal. That's our law. Caffeine is wrong. Follow the, you know, follow the spiritual law. I don't know what God feels about caffeine. It's not in my Bible. I think he's good with it. He just says, limit it to a few cups a day. <laughs> don't overdo it. Um, so he ended up buying his glasses and a glass of milk. And that's why I look at sometimes what Christians do. They get part of what they want, and they compromise on the other part. Get what I'm saying? And when we look at this, law works. It's just a failure. You can't compromise it. You can't make it work. You'll never get your coffee. You understand where I'm going? The other one is the grace faith way, where it's success based in Christ. Faith and grace is about Christ. So let me give you the translation in closing, and next week we'll pick up with a summary of one through four and go into five and six, which will be even more fun. Okay? You who have sought to be justified by law, you have been cut off from Christ, and the grace that we are to live by, you have fallen from that grace system, that grace way of life, and you are debtors forever. As long as you remain in that system. I'm no longer a debtor because we're in Christ. That debt has been taken by another, and we've been reconciled to God. See how beautiful this understanding becomes when we understand what Christ has done for us? Well, next week we're going to pick up, oh, I do have the definite, I do have the, if you want to, debtors you are. That sounds like Yoda, doesn't it? Those of you Star Wars fans, debtors you are. Oh. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time as we've looked at your wonderful book of Galatians and what Paul was uh, very dogmatic about, very uh, strong with, that it's either all of Christ or none of Christ. We, couldn't, we cannot mix. We shouldn't mix. We shouldn't think that something else will get us through, through the uh, obstacles of life that will get us right with God. It's only about Christ and how we function in the believer's life. And next week when we pick up with verses 5 and 6, we'll see how much greater we have it than anyone in the lost system could ever have it. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be dismissed.